In this video, we're going to talk about proximate integration. So a bit of warning. Approximate integration is a very big topic. It is very important for many fields of engineering, science, and mathematics. And in fact, you could make your entire career out of working on approximate integration. So we are just going to barely touch this of this field. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to find an approximate value of a definite integral from a to b of f of x dx. And we're going to use five different methods. Now, three of them are just review because we saw this when we looked at the definition of the definite integral in calculus one. And those are the left endpoint rule, the right endpoint rule, and the midpoint rule. But then there's two new ones we want to look at as well, called the trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule. We'd like to know how these methods are connected to each other. And we'd like to determine error bounds for at least some of the methods, meaning that we know we have an approximation. Do we have an idea without knowing the exact value what kind of error we could expect in that approximation. So here I have just a nice cubic polynomial, and we're going to try to use this as our example problem to uh, estimate the value of the integral of this function between negative 1 and positive 4. So we're going to start with just a review of the ideas we use to define the definite integral. We said that the uh, definite integral can be approximated by this Riemann sum. Remember delta x, the idea is we take our whole interval, divide it up into n subintervals, and then we are going to, uh, in each subinterval, we're going to uh, replace the area with a rectangle. And then to figure out the height of that rectangle, we just choose some value x sub i star, which is in that subinterval. So, for example, between x naught and x1, which is between negative 1 and negative 0.5. I could choose any number in between there. In order to make the analysis easy, though, uh, we don't just choose a random number. Uh, we might choose, say, the left endpoint. So you can see that in this first subinterval, the height of the rectangle is determined by the height of the function at the left endpoint of the interval. And that is how we determine the height for all of those rectangles. And if we do that, we get the following approximation, where we're just going to factor out this delta x, which remember is the width of each of the uh, triangles there, I mean rectangles. And, um, and then I'll just have the height. And the heights are going to start here at x0. And then the last height is at x sub n minus 1, and here x sub 9. Now, notice a few things about the left endpoint rule. Here our shaded area represents L sub 10. And note that my left endpoint rule, it overestimates the integral value when f of x is decreasing. So between, say, uh, negative 1 and 0, or from 3 to 4, you can see that the rectangles are all or contain area outside of the area that I'm looking for. So over here is the same way. However, if the function is increasing, the rectangles are all below the curve, and so I get an underestimation. And for our example problem, so for this particular uh, cubic polynomial, 
If I use the left endpoint to estimate the value of the definite integral, I get about 11.016. Instead of using the left endpoint, I could choose the right endpoint. And we'd get the following approximation. Looks very much like the left endpoint, but the difference is, is that now in our formula, we're starting here at x sub 1 and going to x sub n, because x sub 1, of course, is the right endpoint of my first interval. x sub n is the right endpoint of my last interval. So I've chosen the height of my rectangles to be the function value at the right endpoint of each subinterval. Now, when I do that, you can see that I have the opposite behavior from the left endpoint. That is, when the function is decreasing, all of the rectangles are below the curve meaning that we have an underestimate for the integral value. However, if the function is increasing, all of the rectangles are outside the curve or above the curve, meaning we have overestimated the integral value. And so if I use this right endpoint rule uh, with our example definite integral, I'll get this uh, value of 10.391. Well, instead of choosing the left endpoint or the right endpoint, let's go literally in the middle. And immediately you can see by choosing in the middle, whether the function is increasing or decreasing, we have part of the rectangle outside the curve and we're missing a part. And so we would expect that those would compensate for each other and we would get a better result. So we just take the height of each rectangle to be the function value at the midpoint. In fact, I might've missed this one. The midpoint of each of the subintervals. And for our example problem, m sub 10 then would be about 10.742. Now let's get to something new. Those first three methods were just using rectangles to represent the area. But it would seem like a reasonable thing to say, instead of having just a constant height, why don't I use the secant line between the function values at the left and the right endpoint to cut, you know, to cop, sorry, to be the top of my approximation. And so then I'll get a trapezoid. I'll have a trapezoid on each subinterval. And again, just by looking at this, you can see that it seems like these uh, secant lines are very good approximations of the uh, function, at least when you have a small enough delta x. So we would expect to get a, a better answer. So let's just remember if I'm trying to find the uh, area of a trapezoid, it's one half h times the quantity a plus b. h in this case is the distance between the parallel sides, while a and b are the lengths of the parallel sides. And so in my trapezoid, my first trapezoid, well, in every trapezoid, h is the same as delta x. And so my parallel sides here would be the function value at the left endpoint and the function value at the right endpoint. So the area of my first trapezoid would be one half. Well, here's my delta x, delta x for 
all of these I'm using 10 trapezoids would just be half times h, and this is a plus b. And then for the uh, second trapezoid, I'd add half times h, and here's my a and b again. And I think we're getting the picture, so let me just go and write out all 10 of them. So all 10 formulas. And the reason why I wrote out all 10 of them is to say, well, can we look at the uh, sum of them? Let's go ahead and sum them out. First of all, we notice that all of them have this 1 half h. So that's going to be a common factor. Here. And then we'll start with, well, f of negative 1. That only appears in one of my trapezoid area formulas. But I've got an f evaluated at negative 1 half. I see that in the first area as to area and in the second area as well. So I'm going to have two of those. Well, the same thing occurs then with f at 0. It's in the second and the third area, or the second and the third trapezoidal areas. And in fact, that continues all the way. Every single entry is doubled up until I get to the very last, where I only have one. So the very first and the very last appear in only one of the area calculations, but all of the intermediate values appear in two of the calculations. If I work that out for our example problem, I get 10.703. So our formula then, uh, I just want to make a remark that in these formulas for approximate integration, just as a convention, we're going to see an h in place of delta x. So I'm going to write this formula with an h. I may write it with a delta x later on, but just remember, for approximate integration, h is a synonym for delta x. And so what was our formula that we observed? Well, the first function value and the last function value inside the parentheses occur in only one of the trapezoids, but all of the others in between appear in two of the area calculations for the trapezoids, and so we have to double those up. We might summarize it this way. It may not be worth it. So let's pause here for a minute, and what do we have so far? We've got the left endpoint rule, the right endpoint rule, the midpoint rule, and now we just learned the trapezoidal rule. And so here I, I kept it with a delta x instead of an h, because look what happens. If I add L sub n and R sub n together, what do I get? Well, I only get one f of x naught, only one f of x n, but I get two of all of the intermediate values. That looks very familiar to the trapezoidal rule. In fact, the, what's inside the brackets is exactly the same, and the difference is that uh, here I have delta x, and here I have delta x over 2. So I can say that, look, the approximation that I get from the trapezoidal rule is exactly ha the average of the approximations from the left endpoint and right endpoint rule. So there's a connection between the trapezoidal rule and the left endpoint and right endpoint. And so far in our example, never worked out the exact value. Uh, so it's actually the exact value is 10 and 35 over 48, which is not a nice number, but it is a decimal, repeating decimal, 10.72916 with the six repeating. So if I look at my approximations, uh, the left endpoint and the right endpoint were pretty far off. Uh, 
both the midpoint and the trapezoidal rule at least got the first decimal point correct, that it looks like the uh, midpoint rule is just slightly better than the trapezoidal rule for this problem. So let's talk about error bounds. What I mean by error is the difference between the exact value of the definite integral, which in most cases we don't know that. Only, only for our academic example uh, do, are we able to calculate the exact value. Um, so it's the difference between the exact value and our estimate or approximation. And so we're just going to use a subscript m for a midpoint, t for trapezoidal. It's not worth uh, looking at the uh, left endpoint or the right endpoint. And so we're not going to go into the math that is used to derive this. That's a little bit more advanced for this course. Um, it just takes up a lot of time. It's not that hard. But suppose that the uh, second derivative, the absolute value of the second derivative, is bounded by this capital letter k, some number k, for all x and a, b. Then we can show that the error bound for the midpoint rule and the error bound for the trapezoidal rule look very similar. Both of them have this uh, b minus a squared over n squared multiplied times k. The only difference is that the error bound on the midpoint rule has 24 whereas the error bound for the trapezoidal rule has 12. And that doesn't say or always mean that the midpoint rule is going to be better than the trapezoidal rule, but all things considered that not knowing what the error is, uh, you would expect to get a smaller error for using the same value of n on the same interval with the same function using the midpoint rule rather than the trapezoidal rule. So let's look at an example using the error bound for the midpoint rule. I'd like to get an approximation for the definite integral from 0 to 1 of sine of pi x dx. And I want to have an approximation where the error is less than 10 to the negative 5 power. Well, I need to find this value of k. So let me calculate the second derivative. And then I know that sine of x, the absolute value of sine of x, is never bigger than 1. So the absolute value of the second derivative is never, never bigger than pi squared. So that'll be my value of k. k will equal pi squared. So we want this formula to be less than 10 to the minus fifth. So b minus a here is just 1 minus 0. So that makes that part of the calculation simple. And so k is pi squared times 1 squared over 24. n squared has got to be less than 10 to the negative fifth. So let's do some algebra to get n squared by itself. n squared has got to be bigger than pi squared over 24 times 10 to the negative fifth which means that n has got to be bigger than 202.8. And what integer is bigger than 202.8? That's 203. So if I want to get an error bound, meaning that I know for sure that the error uh, between my the exact value and the approximation is less than 10 to the minus fifth, I'll have to use at least 203 subintegrals. I may be able to use less, but I wouldn't know that unless I already knew the exact value. And if I knew the exact value, then I wouldn't need to calculate an approximate value, usually. So our last technique is going to be the most complicated one. Uh, but it is kind of an extension or the natural next step after the trapezoidal rule. With the trapezoidal rule, we were going to replace a flat constant height with the a sloping height. Uh, 
which was the secant line. Well, now we're going to use not only a sloping height, we're going to try to get a curving height where that curve is a parabola. So we're going to have to use an even number of uh, subintervals because what we're going to do is going to go over two subintervals. And for the three function points, so for the left, the middle, and the right, I'm going to find a parabola that passes through those three points. And so if you think about the parabola, its formula is ax squared plus bx plus c. There are three coefficients, so I need three points of information to determine those coefficients. So three points determine a parabola. So I'm going to calculate the area under the parabola and use that as an approximation for the area under the curve. And then what I'll do is I'll go to the next two subintervals, and I'll fit a different parabola to those three points, calculate its area, and then continue across the next you know, pairs of subintervals until I get to the end. So now I'd like to find a formula then for this calculation. So the idea is replace the height with a parabolic curve and then calculate the integral under that parabola and use that as an approximation for the area under the curve and do that for every pair of subintervals. Well, in order to come up with a formula, we're going to make a fairly simple assumption, which is that um, the uh, subinterval, the two subintervals are centered on the y axis. Now, the location of the y axis really does not have any impact on the area under this curve. If the y axis were over here on the left hand side of the page, it wouldn't matter, the area would still be the same. And so we're not changing the area, we're just trying to make the analysis a little bit simpler. So we've got our three points that we have to fit through the parabola. So in other words, I'm going to have a parabola ax squared plus bx plus c. And uh, if x naught y naught passes through that parabola, then this equation has to be satisfied. So now this is where our simplifying assumption helps us. If I replace x naught with negative h, remember h here is also the same as delta x, then I have, okay, a h squared minus b h plus c equals y sub zero. The second point has to be on the parabola as well. So a x one squared plus b x one plus c has to equal y one. And then this helps a lot. If x1 is 0, that means that uh, c has to be y1. And then for our third point, has to be on the parabola as well. So ax2 squared plus bx2 plus c has to equal y2. But then if x2 is h, then I'll have ah squared plus bh plus c equals y2. So that's slightly simpler. And then if I look at the first and the third equation, if I add those two together, I'll get 2ah squared plus 2c equals y naught plus y2. And that gives us this nice relationship here between my y values. So, you know, these are my function values, my y values, and the uh, a and h. So ideally, you know, what I'm trying to do is get a formula for this the, of the integral of the parabola. I don't really care what a, b, and c are. I just want a formula uh, for that integral, which only contains the h, 
and the y values. So this equation is going to help us do that. But let's look at this integral a little bit more carefully. We said that x sub 0 is negative h and x sub 2 is positive h. So now my bounds are opposites of each other. So let me break this into two integrals. My first integral is an even function, and the second integral has an odd integrand. And what do we know? Well, if the bounds are opposites and I have an odd function for the integrand, that integral is going to be 0. And for an even function, I can bring a multiplier 2 out in front and just change the lower bound to 0. So now let's take the antiderivative, and I'll evaluate that between 0 and h. And I get this expression here. And I'm getting closer, uh, because I know c here is going to be y1. And uh, the only thing that would be left over is just this a. So uh, what I'm going to do, rather than you know, try to solve this equation for a and make a substitution, it's actually easier if I factor out an h over 3. Because if, what, look at this term. If I factor out h over 3, what's left over is 2a h squared which is exactly what I have here. Now, when I factor out the h over 3, just be careful with the algebra here. Now, if I multiply this through, in order to get 2ch here, I need to have a 6c. So now let's go ahead and make these replacements. I'm going to replace 2ah squared with y0 minus 2y1 plus y2. And now I'll replace 6c with 6y1. Combine the like terms, and now I've got this nice formula for the integral of the parabola, and it only has the h and the y values. So that would be for my first uh, subintervals. Then I could do the same thing for the next subintervals, but instead of having y0, y1 and y2, I have y2, y3, and y4. And then in the next one, I'll have y4, y5, and y6, and so on, until I've done all of the uh, n over 2 pairs of subintervals. So if I look at this, if I want to add all of these up, well, I'm only going to get one y0, but then I have four y1 and no other y1 in any of the other ones. But y2 appears in the first one and the second one, so I'm going to get two of the y2. Then I'll have a four of the y3, and then y4 again appears in two of the calculations. And so that pattern is going to continue. I'll have four times the odd number, 2 times the even number until I get to the very end, where again I'll have 2 times the even number, 4 times the odd number, and then the very last one only appears once. And it shouldn't surprise us if we really think of our odd number points as being the midpoint of this larger uh, subinterval that there's a connection to the midpoint, and there's also a connection to the trapezoidal rule. So we could find Simpson's rule by taking this weighted average of the uh, approximation from the trapezoidal rule and the approximation from the midpoint rule. And the error bound for Simpson's rule involves a bound on the fourth derivative. So we have to know, well, if we can find a number where the value of the fourth derivative in absolute value is uh, less than some number capital K for all the values of x in the interval of integration, then we know that the error is bounded by k times b minus a to the fifth 
over 180 n to the power of 4. So if we go back to our example and we use Simpson's rule, um, this surprised me. I know that Simpson's rule will give you the exact answer for a parabola because you're going to fit it. But we got the exact answer here, uh, the exact value using Simpson's rule. So that's uh, not going to be the case in, all the time when uh, when you're using a, an unusual function any or any polynomial which has degree more than two. But there it is. We got the exact value. So we got lucky there. So let's do another example using our error bound. This time the error bound for Simpson's rule. We're going to use the same definite integral and we're going to want to use Simpson's rule and ensure that our error is smaller than 10 to the minus fifth. So remember the error bound formula involves the fourth derivative. So let's go ahead and calculate the fourth derivative. And again, it is pi to the power of four. It's a multiple of sine of pi x. Well, the absolute value of sine of pi x is never bigger than one. So the absolute value of the fourth derivative is never bigger than pi to the power of four, which will be our k value. And again, here we have b minus a equaling one. So uh, if we go ahead and substitute our values and solve for n to the power of four, then take the fourth root of each side, we'll find that n should be bigger than 15.25. And what's the next biggest uh, integer that is 16. So if you use n equal to 16, which has to be an odd number too. So if this had turned out to be 14.25, I couldn't say n is 15. I would have to use 16. Remember, n must be even. And uh, compare that to what we got with the midpoint rule, we would need to use 203 subintervals. So let's look at a summary here. We have uh, a number of rules. The first three were just review from Calc 1, just using uh, different choices in our Riemann sum, either the left endpoint, the right endpoint, or the midpoint. Then we had our two new rules, the trapezoidal rule and Simpson's rule. And we found these relationships that uh, the trapezoidal rule approximation is the average of the left endpoint and the right endpoint approximations. And then the approximation from Simpson's rule is a weighted average of the approximation from the trapezoidal rule and the midpoint rule. And then we had our error bounds. So again, I know that this was a, a, a lot of information, but really this summary kind of contains the inform our takeaways. And um, I hope you find this uh, video useful.